if you would like to find out how to use a GoPro in your boat without it being a giant pain in the butt, this might be the seminar for you. What's going on everybody? My name's Brian, you're watching Angling Anarchy. This week's video is from my seminar at 2022 Wisconsin Muskie Expo that was held in Wausau, Wisconsin. It's a fantastic expo. I want to give a big thanks to Rich and Penny Reinert for letting me speak at this thing and Mike Etzel, uh, the guys that make all of that happen. It was a fantastic show and I had a great time being the first speaker on Friday to not too many people but just enough. It was a nice comfortable crowd and uh, I just had a blast doing that so thanks for that opportunity. So what will follow is my seminar. I tried to film it with this camera. I failed miserably so I had another GoPro set up off to the side so I'm using that so it's not the the best perspective but what I try to do is go through the seminar and interject little pieces of video and that sort of thing to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about as the seminar goes along. So with that please enjoy this seminar about how to get a GoPro in your boat without it being a giant hassle. All right here's the first big one is powering the camera. GoPro batteries these little guys are good for about an hour and a half at usually at best you might be able to squeak two out of it but for the most part one and a half hours so not only do you have to buy a bunch of batteries which are twenty dollars a piece if you're buying GoPro batteries you can buy off-brand batteries it's a little bit cheaper but you still run into the problem of you've got your camera all nice and set up it's pointed the direction you want it to and now you've got to take it all apart, put a new, you know, every hour and a half, two hours, put a new battery in, and that's enough to make somebody say, this isn't what I want to be doing. I started to wonder about uh, other ways to power the cameras. I know I had talked to Greg Thomas, Greg Thomas from Muskie Hunter. He used to do a lot of filming back in the day. He would power the GoPro by plugging in the USB mini port on the side, which is basically charging the battery in the camera but then you're also running it and filming with it. Unfortunately, that makes the camera overheat. It's not really good for it. It works, like you can make it do it, but it's, it's not the best for it. There's a product that I started using, uh, it's called, do I have it up there? No, I might have it on the next one. But anyway, it's called a Switronics battery eliminator. And now, now this is only for the GoPros three and four. Most of you guys probably have something a little bit older, but if you have the threes and the fours, that's actually what I'm wearing right now on my chest cam. It plugs into the back of the camera. You take the battery out so you don't have to rely on the battery being in there. And it's connected to one of these little Anker 13,000 milliamp uh, battery packs. These are just the, you know, people typically use them to charge your cell phone. So what this does, and that, that was the big problem of, you know, if you've got a head cam on or a chest cam, constantly trying to change batteries. This way, I can just run a cord. I don't know, for you, those of you that are here early, I ran a cord down my back and in my pocket, I've got the battery pack. So now it's all one self-contained unit. These things will run with GoPro 12 hours, give or take. So now you don't have to worry about uh, the battery issue. The other thing you can do in the boat is a lot of the new boats have USB adapters in them. Even if they don't, they've got a 12 volt uh, battery, uh, um, cigarette lighter adapter that you can put one of the dual USB chargers in and plug it right into there. I, I used to do that, I don't anymore because I've got two Helix 12s that really like to uh, drain the juice in the uh, boat battery and there was just too much going on. So pretty much all the GoPros in my boat are powered externally with either one of these little Anker packs or I found out if you've got Milwaukee, DeWalt, any of those types of batteries, they make these little handy dandy slide on deals. Um, they've got a USB port right here. This will run a GoPro for days. This is the five amp one, they've got different sizes, but these, these work really nice. If, you, if you've got tools and you've got them sitting around already, that's a nice option uh, to be able to use. So uh, down at the bottom there, uh, I was talking about the Hero 3s and 4s. You, you can force the camera to run and keep charging the battery as it's running, but uh, sometimes you run into problems with the camera shutting off. I find with this uh, Switronics plug-in, you have a lot better luck at not having the battery overheat and just having it run continuously. 
that thing right there. And any of the stuff I'm talking about, in, if you go on the YouTube channel, any of the new videos, like I don't know, the last hundred or so, I've got links for Amazon to every single one of the, the products I use because I have people asking me all the time, it's the easiest way to do it. If you go in there, there's a huge list of all the, the camera products that I use. So um, if you're having a hard time finding it, it should be there. If you can't find it there, I encourage everyone, if you have questions about this stuff, uh, hit me up on Facebook, comments in the YouTube channel, however you want to. I'm more than happy to help. The Hero 5 through 10, so the newer iterations of the GoPros, they got away from using the USB mini port on the side. It's a USB-C, so it's kind of the oval one that you can, doesn't matter how you plug it in, it'll work. Those you can power now without having the battery. In fact, if you have the battery in and you're trying to power it through the USB-C port on the side, it'll just, it'll shut off. It doesn't like it. So you're way further ahead, take the battery out, just plug it in. Um, it's, it's a really nice way to, to be able to power the cameras. Another option is a YOLO tech stick. Have you guys seen these around? Um, it's a cool product. I, I, the main reason I don't use it is because I started filming before this was a thing. I think this won best product at iCast in 2015. I started filming in 2013, so I started building stuff in the boat and that, that I've been using ever since and never really saw a need for it. But I did buy one just to have one. The only thing I don't like about these, and this one extends, it's got two USB ports up on top and it plugs into your navigation light adapter. I know uh, if you guys know who Josh Rabska is, he does quite a bit of filming. He's got nav ports set up all over his boat. So he's got more than just the front and the back of the boat to set this up in. My only issue with this, the one time I did try to use it, again, with those two Helix 12s sucking battery juice so bad, the GoPro kept shutting off on me because it was trying to use the same power. Um, that and it's only got one point of contact in the boat. So, I mean, they're pretty sturdy, but I just, in my brain, I like to have something that's got two points of contact. So you've got a little bit uh, more rigidness to you know, the camera because the camera, once it's extended, even if there's just one camera and you've got it in, I, I use these little aluminum cases it's pretty heavy. And I see guys with two of them on top of here and that's starting to get pretty tippy. So I do encourage, you know, if you just want one camera in the boat, super simple, these Yolo tech sticks are very nice. If you're going to do something where you feel like you need something a little bit more robust, I'm gonna show you what I've got. But other than this, they really don't make anything to set up cameras in your boat. It's, you gotta figure it out. So I will go over what I did uh, to set up my stuff and that's that. All right, so that's, that gets rid of our powering problem, hopefully. Next problem is running out of SD card space. So when this stuff comes up on Facebook, the two things people bring up are powering and, oh, you're gonna need all sorts of SD cards because you're gonna run out, of, uh, run out of space. If you're constantly filming hours and hours and hours of nothing happening, because that's musky fishing, uh, it, it starts to become a problem. So there is a thing on the GoPros, the Hero 3 and up, so any of the newer ones have this. It's called looping. Are any of you familiar with looping? Tried it? Yeah, some? Okay. So I, I found that even people that use looping don't exactly know how it works. So I did recently just make a video about that. I, you may have seen it, but I will go over that. Question? Can you turn the volume a little bit? Yes. I'll try to talk louder. I'll project. Is that okay? Better. Okay. All right. So I did just make a video about this and I'm going to use the same technique to talk about looping as I did in that. And we'll see how it works. So looping is filming continuously without filling up the SD card because the camera is saving the, instead of saving one big long hours long file, it's taking discrete little chunks of video and when you put them all in your editing timeline it, it's it's continuous but it does that because and here's here's where this comes in it starts filming once you hit the little 
button on the camera, it starts filming and it'll save a one minute file. And then as it gets to, oops, as it gets to two minutes, it saves another file. So on and so forth. If you're filming in the five minute loop, you're gonna have five one minute files. And then what it'll do, once it places a sixth file, we'll just pretend there's six here for, it gets rid of the first one. As soon as it films the next one, it gets rid of that one. Uh, so on down the line. So when you finally hit stop on the GoPro, it's going to be in the middle of a one minute chunk. It's gonna be, uh, you're gonna have a file anywhere from one to 59 seconds. And it'll, it'll stop when you hit the button and it'll save everything from that point back for at least five minutes. It'll be five plus minutes. It does is same sort of thing if you pick the 20 minute. I know some people like, oops, doing the 20 minute loop because you get excited, you hook a fish, you're dealing with it. Uh, there's only been two times where I've missed a hook set on the five minute loop. And that's when I first started and I just, you just forget, you get excited. So that is, that, that can be the problem with the five minute loop sometimes. Some people feel more comfortable with the 20 minute loop. So the five minute loop, this is what it's gonna look like on your computer when you start the camera and then stop it. That's what it's gonna save. This is the oldest file, 1254. So every minute it saves a new file. One minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, and about 30 seconds probably. So the nice part about this is filming all day, two, three, 12 hours, who knows. Camera's continuously running. When you look at the camera, it's gonna say, you know, on the, on the screen here, the little screen, if you're on the five minute loop, it'll stop at five minutes. Don't worry, as long as it's flashing, it's still recording. It's basically just telling you you're on a five minute loop. And then the 20 minute loop saves in, in five minute chunks. So yeah, you might be able to save yourself from missing the hit, but what I tell people is if you're using the five minute loop, you catch a fish, as soon as you get it in the net and all the melee subsides, just stop the camera, start it right back up again, take care of the fish. So even if you don't use at least five minutes say you fish for another, or say you're dealing with the fish for another two and a half minutes. You hit start, two and a half minutes goes by, you hit stop, you're gonna have two one minute chunks and a 30 second chunk. And it's all there, it's all saved, you don't have to worry about it, and that way, you know, so you stop it, you've got five or six minutes, and then another two and a half, as opposed to the 20 minute where you've got at least 20 minutes, possibly another five. So you're using up that SD card uh, a lot quicker on the 20, but again, some people feel more comfortable using it that way. So here, those, uh, it's not the same files in the, from the last slide, but it is six files. So this is, I've stopped the camera, and this is what I ended up with. I've got one minute, two, three, four, five, and then there's my little portion. So this right here is where I hit the stop button and that's the previous five minutes behind it. Does that make sense? Excellent. All right, so we've solved the two biggest problems, hopefully. The next thing you wanna do is pick the resolution on your camera. Unless you're making a documentary for Discovery Channel, you probably don't need to use 4K. If you feel like you're going to need to zoom in go for it because 4K has approximately four times the amount of pixels as 1080 does. And that gets confusing because 1080 is actually 1080 by 1920 and 4K is 3840 by 2160 or so. So they, 1080 is the horizontal and 4K is the, or the vertical and 4K is the horizontal. So why they did that, I don't know. But 1080 seems to be a really good um, resolution to use your cameras at. You don't necessarily want to go less than that. At 1080, 60 frames per second 
if my memory serves me correctly, a 32 gigabyte chip will hold an hour and 15 minutes of footage. So that's approximately 12 times starting and stopping on a five minute loop. If you start and stop 12 times in a day of musky fishing, you're doing good. So I can usually get away with either, I don't have any SD cards that I use that are over 64 gigabytes. Because it just, uh, for a day of fishing, I don't, I, I carry extras and there's the odd time where I might have, if a camera's acting up and keeps shutting off or something, it'll save the footage and it's not footage I want saved, so I'll have extra on there. So I might have to switch out a card occasionally, but it's not very often that I have to do that. So that's resolution. Frames per second, typically you want to go, for me anyway, 60 is a good one to go with. Most of your TV is 30 frames per second, or it's 29.97, it's some goofy number, but we just round up. So 30 frames per second. Most of your movies that you watch are 24 frames per second. So 24 and 30 are what most of the media we watch is uh, shown to us at. The reason I do 60 or possibly 120 is for slow motion. And I can't, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, but here we go. I've got videos that I made a long time ago that have crummy slow motion. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. When you see slow motion that just is kind of choppy, it's because the original video wasn't filmed at a high enough frame rate for it to be slowed down. If you see that nice smooth, you know, you like a muskie's jumping next to the side of the boat and you, you can see the individual water droplets, that was filmed at a really high frame rate so that when you slow it down, you still have enough frames per second to make it look cinematic or, or make it look nice at that 24 or 30. So real quick math for you, follow me with this. If I'm filming at 120 and something cool happens that I want to slow down, in that one second, I've got 120 frames. So when we take it to the editing software, it's gonna change it to 24 or 30. Whatever you have the editing software set at, that's what it exports the video at. So you could have 120 frames per second clip and a, a 30 and a 60, and if you've got it set at 30 frames per second, it's gonna take one, one of every four of the 120 frame per second, and that's all it needs. So you have excess frames and it still looks nice. Same with the 60. It's taking the 30 that it needs and getting right rid of the rest of it. So you have an excess when you're watching it normally. When you slow it down, so say you wanna slow something down five times. If you've got 120 frames per second and you slow it down five times, you still have 24 frames. 120 divided by five, 24. So when you slow it down in that timeline, you've still got those frames in there, so when your, your eyes are watching it, it's flickering fast enough that it looks smooth. If you try taking 30 frame per second footage, and it's, oh, that's so cool, it's, I'm gonna slow it down. <laughs> Good luck. You can do it, but in that one second, if you try to slow 30 frames down, now you're left with six frames trying to be flashed, and that's why it looks choppy. Um, so that, that's, that's one of those things that people run into. I, you know, I'm just assuming, but I'm, I'm guessing they get really cool footage and I, I'm, I gotta slow this down. And come hell or high water, they're gonna slow the footage down. Doesn't matter what it looks like, it's slow motion. Well, there's good slow motion, there's bad slow motion. Yes, sir? Yeah. Say you went with 120. Yep. Okay, you got your one minute, you're looping it. Yep. Minute, you know, how, how much more of the SD card will that fill? So, it will. Yep. Yep. Good question. So the, what did I say? An hour and 14 on 32 gigs at 1080, 60. So it'll be 37 minutes. So the, typically what I do, the, the boats or the camera that I have in the boat, the two that are on the gunnel that I feel like it's going to have a fish jumping in front of it, might have something cool happen that I want to slow down. I run those at 120. So I put bigger SD cards in those cameras. The pole that I have in the boat behind me, um, I typically run that at 60. That way you still have room to slow it down a little bit, but I'm not as, I'm not as worried about super slow motion 
on those. Uh, same with the, the chest camera. I typically stick with 1080, uh, 60 uh, for, this, for this camera as well. But yeah, so simple math, it just, it just takes up twice as much space, 60 to 120 or four times 30 to 120. Oh yeah, yeah. And on a sixty, on a sixty-four, so on a sixty-four gig, you've still got even at one twenty, you've still got an hour yeah. worth. Yep, yep, yep. So the, I, got <laughs> I really like using the GoPro app. Most of the GoPros now are either wireless or uh, yeah, wireless uh, Bluetooth, so they can link up to your phone. I hate trying to go through the hit the buttons and find stuff on the menus. It's I, I've been using these things forever and I wouldn't be able to tell you how to do it because I just have them all set up on my phone. I give them a, a name, you know, Angling Anarchy One, Two, Three, whatever it is. I can link up to it, and that way all my settings for this camera or for each individual camera are on one page. I can tell it to loop. I can tell it not to loop. I can tell it my resolution. I can set up everything on the phone. Especially, so this is the pole that I use in my boat. So this is on the gunnel. I mean, I could try to like stand on the gunnel and hold on to this and look at the screen and try to get it. No, I'm gonna fall in. I'm not that graceful. Um, but I can get these set up, bring it up on my phone. I can actually look at what's being seen by the camera on the phone, give it a little tweak, and then set them and start fishing. So using that, that app is, is a definite must, I think. So yeah, it helps you, you know, change settings and position the camera. The skeleton cases I use, they're just aluminum CNC skeleton cases. You find them on Amazon for 20 bucks. They're nice because they let the camera breathe a little bit. They don't overheat as much when you've got them on these. And then you can add these cool, uh, they're CPLs. Circular, circular polarized filters. So these will help you get rid of the glare on the water. Um, it's not, well, the, these are more than the cases. These are like 50 bucks each, but you can get cheaper ones than that. These are just the, the ones I like using. All right. <laughs> All right. How many of you hate watching videos with a chess cam? <laughs> these guys back here. You don't have to like not raise your hand, it's not gonna hurt my feelings. But. So we're gonna go over the advantages, disadvantages. The head mount, your advantages, higher perspective and your hands aren't in the way. That's probably the biggest thing. Hands in the way all the time. Or somebody goes for a figure eight and all you can see is their feet or the other side of the boat because you're, you're bent over. So I got you, I got you. I was the same way when I started watching do you know who John B, Perrick, all these guys that are, you know, they're not musky fishermen per se, but they're, they're bass fishing. They've got, I think John B is at 1.5 million um, subscribers. These are huge channels. And most of the footage they have, at least when they first started out, was from, uh, from a chess cam. And I'll, I'll talk about why that is. So you've got a higher perspective. You don't have your hands in the way. You're up so you can see the fish coming in on a figure eight. So that, that's all good. Disadvantages. Uncomfortable, yes. I wore one for about 30 seconds and I was done. I didn't want to deal with that. Musky fishing's hard enough. I don't want a headache. Um, the audio suffers sometimes. I don't know if you pay much attention to it, but unless you're just watching a clip of, oh, hey, this fish jumped, it's cool, or we caught this, it's cool. If you're watching a, a 10 or 12 minute video where they're trying to tell a story. You know, we started here, we're doing this, this happened, this. If the audio stinks, I don't care how good the videography is, you're not gonna watch it. Audio is way more important than most people give it credit for. So that's probably one of the main reasons I wear one of these, and we'll, but we'll get to that. Almost constantly, it's like watching the Blair Witch Project. I know that's an old reference, but that's all I can come up with. Um, it, it's just, even though, even though you don't think you're moving your head, you are. So you're, it's over here in this, and you might get, you might get seven seconds of a, a beautiful fish coming in, and that's great, but you better have some other cameras set up to back up that footage for when it gets crazy or, or jumpy or, or crummy. 
So, uh, you know, it is. It, I don't want to say it's bad footage. Doug Wagner, he does a really nice job of using the short clips from a head cam in his video and then augments it with other shots from the boat. So if you're just using one camera, you do get that cool shot, but the rest of the video, as far as I'm concerned, is not the, not the greatest. All right, so the chest mount, the advantages. 95% of the audio I use in my videos is this. That's $175 mic on the nice camera. Most of the time when we get a fish out and I'm talking about it, I drop the audio out of that and use this because it's typically better. The, the, I use a Hero 4 Silver. I think it's probably the best microphone that uh, GoPro ever had because this was the last camera they made that wasn't intrinsically waterproof. So the five and up, you don't have to have it in a case as long as you've got all the hatches closed, it's waterproof. But that means you have to make a waterproof mic. And a waterproof mic sounds like this a lot of the time. It's just not the, the nines and tens and the, the newer ones have solved that problem a little bit, but I still feel like the audio from this is, is a lot better. And that's where the John B story comes in. Uh, today's angler, I'm friends with Robbie and Lee, they film with John B and that's what John told them is the reason you see most people most successful YouTubers anyway, wearing a chest cam, is they're trying to tell a story in their video and they want their audio to be very good. So it's right here. So even, even if, you know, with, with all the other cameras set up, even if I don't use the video from this, I've got fantastic audio. The upside is every now and again, because I see people wearing them like this at an angle down. So yeah, your hands are in the way and a lot of times the camera's down here. The mount I've got sits a little bit higher up on my chest, just enough, and I, you know, I do force myself to keep my hands down a little bit more. I fish a little bit different. So if you don't want to make that sacrifice, maybe not the best thing, but... And then what I do is keep it about parallel to my chest. That way, when I'm fishing, my hands and the rod are maybe in the very, very bottom portion of the screen. If I bend over, now it's pointing right, right at a fish. Your hands will still get in the way, but here again, I've, I make some sacrifices when I figure eight, maybe do it one-handed or something to keep my hands out of the way. Um, but yeah, so that way I've got awesome audio and hey, I might capture something cool. If I don't, I've got other cameras in the boat to take care of that. Um, it's, they're, they're pretty comfortable. Compared to a head mount, it's, they're a lot more comfortable than that, that's for sure. Let's see what kind of time we got here. All right, we're doing good. There's less movement, so when you're, when you're fishing and your, your head's all over the place, your chest is usually pretty stationary, or at least it's not as all over the place as your head is. It gives you a nice POV or a point of view when you're talking about baits. So for me, when I'm starting the day out, I usually say, hey, you know, I've got a Navin and a surgical strike and, and it's right here. It looked pretty silly if hey guys This is what I'm doing today and trying to film it with a, a chest or a, a head cam up here So it's just nice for the filmmaker I guess to have it right here because then you can talk about things and uh, it works works pretty nice that way So and then we went over some of the disadvantages if worn improperly the video definitely does tend to suffer and Your hands definitely will get in the way, but again Wear it up a little bit higher and keep it pointed up a little bit more than, than you, you'd think you need it to. And you're still on the wide view. It captures all sorts of stuff. So that's that. All right, on the mounting options. Again, with the exception of the YOLO tech stick, you just got to figure it out. Um, I tend to like these little projects out in the garage. You know, I, I can use a RAM mount here and connect it to this and, and make some Rube Goldberg device and make it work. Um, but the windshield gunnel rails work really nice. The GoPro clamps do a really nice job. If it's, if it's around a pole, it does really good. Or if it's something relatively thick, if you've got 
a thin windshield, it tends, since that space in there is just big enough, it rocks back and forth a little bit. I found if you take a piece of either cardboard or, or just take a towel, wrap it up, and wedge it on there, it holds these really nicely on a, on a windshield. I love using RAM mounts. They're super versatile, very secure. These are the two cameras I have on the gunnel of the boat. And I've got some pictures coming up here, so. All right, we talked about the clamp on. The sportsman's mount are these mounts. You know, if, if you wanna come take a look at it afterwards, uh, it's just a different type of clamp mount. Uh, a lot of people use these on shotguns. So that's the, that's the sportsman's, that's what the sportsman's mount is. And then of course the Yolotech. All right, this is probably from like 2014. After watching, I will give all the credit in the world to Mike Keys because I was watching his show and I, th I can't remember if he was using, early on he was using a, a painter's pole, the telescopes to have, you know, to keep some of his cameras on. And I was watching it and not that I thought, hey, I can do exactly what he's doing, but at least it gave me the idea of, oh, okay, I see, I, I see how he's got it set up. I'm going to attempt to do that in my boat. And this is what I came up with. All right, so we've got the pole. This down here, I was wandering through Farm and Fleet trying to figure out how I'm gonna make a base for this thing. That's called a conduit hub. <laughs> it's one inch in diameter. It's about, I don't know, an inch tall. This is three quarters. So this fits in here pretty nicely. I just drilled and tapped a couple holes with a quarter 20 stainless steel screw to have a set screw to keep it in place from rattling around. So that's how it's secured at the bottom. And then this is just the ram mount that you would use to stabilize a trolling motor head. So instead of the trolling motor head, I've got the, oops, undo this a little bit. Ram ball on here, that connects to it. And then it connects to another ram ball that I've drilled and tapped and put a, a small stem on so I can screw it into, this is a, uh, oh shoot, what are those? <sighs> Tight lock rod holders, the little squares. So I, I can just, I can screw, I, I've got four of those on either side of the boat. I made a, a ram ball so that I can screw it into those anywhere along the boat that I want to. And now it's, it's pretty versatile. And I did, there is, it's hard to see, but there's a little piece of, of aluminum, flat aluminum that I put under that so that this isn't digging into the carpet underneath. So that's how that's set up. And then I just run uh, a couple of cords up to the cameras and power them. Well, these ones I typically power with uh, the Milwaukee batteries. And those are the type of shots that you get with that setup. So it's, it's nice because it's up high enough that you get a little bit of down, but it, it, it captures quite a bit. So this was early on, again, ram ball screwed into the tight lock mount. Now, if you've got a rail system, uh, uh, ram makes, they make all sorts of stuff. It's amazing the amount of products they have, but you can get them that will bolt onto a rail so if you have a rail on the side of your boat, you could do the same thing, put ram balls along that. Uh, lots, lots of different ways to do it. So that was just a, an arm that I had a clamp on, you know, so there's the, my two cameras, uh, a little bit more sophisticated now. I went to, instead of the one inch ball, this is the one and a half. It's way more secure, so these don't flop around too much when this is really tightened down. And then just the one inch ball, and I've got the two cameras, middle of the boat, looking to both sides to capture anything, like netting the fish, the fish jumping boat side, that sort of thing. All right, so you can get creative. That's me and Nate trolling on Lake Michigan for salmon. That's the Minn Kota pushed all the way up, locked in place, and I've just got one of these and I, we just drove around with the Minn Kota up all day, and it was where we put our camera. So 
Um, lots of different ways you can, you can make it work. So obviously I'm doing all this and I'm trying to create content on YouTube and, and it's a bit more than most of you want to do, but hopefully you've got some ideas of how to set up uh, a camera in the boat. And what I tell people is, like you're a football coach and this is your game film, you can watch yourself make mistakes and hopefully learn from it. So I'm gonna try to scrub through this here. I need to get down to the, let's see here. Come on. Oh. Well, that's no good. It's a bunch of me actually catching stuff. I don't know why it doesn't want to work on there. Okay, well, anyway, we'll just talk about it. A couple years back, I was up in Canada, and I had a fish that I, or, well, I, I cast to the shoreline, kind of looked down, I'm reeling my bait in, and my buddy Dave says, hey, idiot, a fish just rolled on your bait, pay attention. I cast this way, and the boat is facing almost towards the fish. So I quick get on the trolling motor, try to turn the boat a little bit sideways so that the boat is perpendicular to the fish. I didn't quite get there, so when I came in, my strong side is to go to the right. I came in to the left, and when the fish surprised me and hit in this top corner, instead of hooking back into the fish, I <laughs> went that way with it. I kind of fought the fish up around the trolling motor. The second mistake I made was hey, the cameras are on that side of the boat, I should force this fish back over there so we can capture this. And in getting back around to the front, I lost it through a small hissy fit, which is kind of fun to watch that, so I kind of bummed if <laughs> it's not working. But, uh, but after going back and watching that, I s started thinking, you know what, You're, you feel more comfortable coming in, going up around, hanging it in the top corner, setting back into the fish, and then there's like six of those back to back to back. Fish comes in, goes in, bam, catch the fish. So that, that was one of the first times I was watching something that I had filmed and thought, I'm making a mistake there, I need to improve upon that. So I encourage everyone to have a camera to make yourself a better fisherman. Um, and it's cool to watch the footage too, so. Oh, it'll let me move it, but I can't play it. That's cool. Well, we're stuck with that. Okay, we'll just go from this. So some other filming tips. If you have one GoPro in your boat, you have two cameras. Because everybody's got a smartphone, and smartphones are great cameras. Um, even just on auto, they, they do a really good job. Where did I put? Oh, it's right in front of me. For a long time, this was my kind of main camera that I would take around the boat when we'd catch a fish. This is what we filmed most of it on. It's just a Sam, it was an old Samsung Galaxy. I wasn't using my actual phone, so it was, it was a couple years older than that. Uh, you can buy this nice little Rode microphone for about 50 bucks, and with a special cable, your, your headphone output, which that might be a problem because they don't have those jacks on most phones anymore, but you can get um, adapters for that. But, so I had some nice audio, the footage was pretty good. I've got a couple camera or a couple of lights here, and then this way you're not trying to hold the phone and you know everybody drops them in the water. So uh, it's a nice way to stabilize the camera. And uh, I did upgrade. I use a, a Canon M50 now, but you know if you've got one GoPro, you've got two cameras because your your phone is always there. So you know definitely definitely use your phone. Film horizontally. Don't unless you're making a TikTok or something like that which I can't make fun of because I've made those before too. Um, the aluminum cases, again, uh, they're, they're nice because uh, the only downside is, is when you're filming continuously and you're powering it continuously, uh, especially on, the, so these are Hero 7s. There's a little door on the side and if you notice, I don't even have the, I just pop the door off because I really don't worry about putting, getting these wet. Um, the downside is, is if it starts raining, you gotta cover them up. It's tough to, it's tough to film in the rain. Um, you can do it to a certain point. I mean, the GoPros will put up with a certain amount of moisture, but if it starts raining pretty hard, you gotta, 
you gotta uh, do something about it. I find with the chest cam, if I if I kind of get my jacket on and my hat, I can actually film with a chest cam most of the day, no matter how how bad it gets. I can almost always have this running because you can kind of kind of crouch over it and and make it work. Um, if anybody ever gets linens, that sort of thing, super nice bags. They've got a zipper on them. You can. Pop them over the camera, zip it on, and now you've got, you know, I've, I've got all sorts of sizes of these so I can throw it over the pole and cover both those cameras. So if it starts raining out, I just get some covers on the camera quick. And as far as getting the audio, one thing I didn't mention, you can see this little fluffy tuft. It's probably hard to see, but um, so these things are called a dead cat because it looks like a dead cat, I guess. Um, the cut down on wind noise. So if you just have if you just have a microphone um, and you've got any sort of wind, you're going to hear that sound. This eliminates it. So the microphone on this GoPro is right up at the top here, and there, there's a little cutout in this case to let sound get to the mic. And I just took I bought a cheap dead cat and I cut little pieces out of it and just fit it in on here over top of it. And that's why the audio ends up being fairly decent. Even if I'm standing with the wind blowing at me, the audio you get is actually still pretty good. As far as file storage and organization goes, everything I get, I put on a two terabyte external hard drive. Uh, it just, it, the video footage is, it's, it takes up a lot of space. So if you start putting it on your computer, it's gonna slow your computer down. I've, I think I've got four or five two terabyte SD cards filled up at this point. Um, so the, definitely uh, good to have one of those. As far as storing your files, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Since I've got so many cameras, so I've got so many things going on, I'll have a folder that says, you know, bow, which is looking at the bow. And then all the files from that day will be in there. I, I tend to save them by, let's say if I'm on a big trip to Eagle Lake, each day is you know, day one, day two, day three, and each one of those folders is bow, stern, gunnel forward, gunnel back, chest cam, uh, cannon, drone, whatever. And then in each one of those is the corresponding footage. You can break it down further than that. You know, whatever, whatever works to keep it organized, just keep it organized. If you're on a long trip and you're filming that day, get back in the cabin, dump all the footage, clear the cards off, and start brand new. I'm usually the idiot that everybody else is drinking and having a good time and I'm sitting there on the computer trying to dump all the footage from that day uh, so I don't forget to do it. And, and it just keeps it, it keeps it organized. Um, that's it for that. One other thing, oops, I wanted to talk about. These are tough to find now, but this is another nice option for mounting cameras. It's called an easy cam post. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever used to watch Giant Quest. It's an old, uh, old show on, I don't even know if the, the videos are on there anymore, but it was Heinrich Beer and Mike Grant, uh, both very good musky fishermen. They made this thing called an easy cam post. And it's, it's pretty cool. You can, they made it so that you can put it on the uh, post of, you know, take the seat off the boat and, and this ratchets it on. Again, two points of contact, keeps it nice and stable, goes up and down. Uh, I've used this fishing with Captain Mark Kornoski on Lake St. Clair. We'll just set up one of those round uh, aluminum rod holders straight up and down and just clamp this onto it, keep it on the side of the boat, and I can set his boat up almost exactly the same way I have my boat set up that way. So that's, if you can find these, um, I, they used to have a website and I, I don't know why, but they're, they're not selling them, but you might be able to find them used or something there. They're pretty handy. I think that's it. Do you guys have questions? Do you film everything in wide or do you have some of them? So he just asked if I film everything in wide or do I use a couple different. I actually do use a couple different settings. Um, on the gunnel, I use wide because it's so close to the water. I want to open it up a little bit and capture everything that happens down there. This, same thing, I film wide. The two cameras on the, uh, the post, those I usually keep it either, depends on which camera you're using. They used to call it medium, and now they call it linear, or vice versa. You'll be able to look on the, I mean, it's, it basically goes from, from narrow to wide. 
if you look at the different settings on the camera. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. What software? Cyberlink. Uh, what's it called? Cyberlink Power Director. It's it's sort of a step down from say Adobe Premiere Pro or uh, what Apple's Final Cut, I think. Ado if you want to get Adobe Premiere Pro, you're paying 20 bucks a month in perpetuity. You can't just buy that software and have it. That's why I went with the Cyberlink. You can, it's 130 bucks. Uh, I think I'm using version 14 or 15. They're up to 20 now. But it's, it's, it's not a professional, but it's, it, they call it like a prosumer grade software. So it's plenty powerful that I don't, I mean, I maybe use 5% of it. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with it, but it's, it's definitely, it's intuitive, it's easy to use. I, I found it really easy to jump into it after using less sophisticated pieces of software. All right, anybody else? All right, thanks everybody, I appreciate it. So there we have it. Hopefully that was of some utility to you. If you have any questions about filming, please leave a comment below and I will try to answer it or hit me up on the Angling Anarchy Facebook page. And thanks to all of you that came out to the shows, stopped by the Chaos Tackle booth, said hi, and thanked me for the content. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it very, very much. With that, I love you guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.